want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to Classic City Crime listeners. I'm Cameron Jay, and I am so uh, honored to have Sheriff James Hale of Oconee County Sheriff's Department here with us to talk about updates on the case of Elijah Wood. You'll recall that Elijah was murdered at the racetrack on Highway 441 in Watkinsville, Georgia, back in March. So, Sheriff, first of all, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. I know today's been a busy day between the storms and everything else, so your time is appreciated with us tonight. Well, thank you for having me on, Cameron. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, as I said from the beginning, I always wanted to provide a platform to you and any law enforcement agency to come on and ask for the public's help, and not only to ask for their help, but to keep them informed. So let's talk a little bit about what that new information looks like tonight. The first thing I wanted to ask is how are things going in the investigation into this murder, um, where things stand now, and uh, more about your sheriff's department's current efforts on the case. Well, um, you know, I, I still feel really optimistic that we're going to catch this killer. Um, I, I really want the family and the community to know that we're using every resource available um, th to make this to make it happen to where we can catch this person. You know, since the very beginning of this case from, you know, March 19th, we've been working with the FBI, the GBI, the ATF, the Department of uh, Community Supervision, um, that which is basically your probation officers, your parole officers. Um, athens Clark County Police Department, we've enlisted some of their help with some of the technology they have over there. And then many other law enforcement agencies around us, you know, touching, touch us and, and, and connect to us. And we've reached out further than that with the uh, Georgia Crime Information um, Network with the GBI. We actually hosted the uh, conference this, this time here at the Civic Center in Oconee, and that was one of the topics that we did cover with that one. Um, we've also gone so far as to enlist some civilian companies to help with some of the forensic analysis of evidence. Um, at this point, we've also enlisted the help of a private investigative firm. Uh, the name of the company is called Chesley Brown International. Uh, they are comprised of a bunch of former law enforcement agents, uh, whether it be FBI agents, actual CIA agents, um, different people like that that come in and, and they have come in and looked at our entire case file. They've reviewed everything we've done up to this point. And the reason we wanted them to come in is because it's always good to have that second or third or fourth set of eyes in law enforcement to come in and review your case to make sure that you haven't missed small little intricacies in this case to make sure that you're, you're doing things the way that you should do them uh, and trying to build the best case we can possibly do. So that's, uh, that's pretty much where we're at and what we've done up to this point. So we just want to clarify here, there is the help of multiple agencies on this case right now. Yes, sir. And they, they've been involved from the very beginning, um, you know, and, that, and that's unfortunate that, we, that they, they have their own cases to work, obviously, but they have technology and resources that we don't have. Um, but we utilize their technology and resources and, and, and it's, it's free to us. So we just, we're, we're able to get them to come in. In fact, the GBI for the first two weeks of this case, we had a GBI agent that was assigned to our office and, and that's all that agent did was work this case. Um, and so we, we, you know, have continued to have that conversation with them on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, they've helped us do a lot of stuff. Right. Right. Well, let's move into talking about, um, about answers. I know that that's the thing you're after. That's the thing the community's after. That's the thing the family's after. Everyone wants the same thing here at the end of the day, even if our personalities or the way we approach it might be differently. So right. are you feeling more confident today than when we last talked about a resolution for this case? I, I don't know that I would say more confident, but equally as confident as, as I was before. Um, you know, I have all the confidence in the world in our investigators and the work that they've done and the work that they are doing on a daily basis. I think the answers are going to come. It's just a matter of time, but you know, it, it is going to take time. I mean, we have to go through all of the tips that come through. We have to um, not just find the person who did it, but all the tips that come through may not necessarily be the person that did it. We've got to, you know, we've got to exclude them as suspects. So in order to do that, you have to work it both ways. And every single person of interest that comes through the tip lines or that comes in as a lead we have to prove they did it or prove they didn't do it. So that, that takes a lot of time 
And uh, we work just as hard to prove they didn't do it as we do to prove that they did do it. And, and, and again, like I said, again, I can't say it enough that it, it takes a lot of time to do that. Sure, sure. One thing that, you know, I think has been obvious to the public and uh, on Facebook and in the media is that there has been seemingly this disconnect between the local family of Elijah Wood and the sheriff's department. I wanted to give you an opportunity now to talk, kind of address that. And it does seem lately that things have been improving. And I just kind of wanted to give you the opportunity to respond to that and address that situation. Right. Honestly, I feel that we've, we've always had a good relationship with most of the family. Um, I know that some of the family has been frustrated with the lack of information that we're putting out. And I understand where that frustration is coming from. Um, unfortunately, as sheriff, it's my job to run these investigations um, you know, and to make sure that our people are dotting every I and crossing every T. And we've only got one shot to put together this case uh, the best that we can. So, you know, that, that's just something that we are going to continue to do. And, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're frustrated, too, that we haven't solved this case as quickly as we would like to. Um, we'd love for this case to be solved right now. But and I'd, I'd much rather be talking to you about the, you know, the arrest of a suspect. But unfortunately, um, we're not at that point yet, but we are going to continue working it. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you for addressing that. Um, yes, sir. You know, some frustration, I think, was coming from that there was this lack of description of the person of interest, but you've not only now released that description, you've gone on to release a sketch as well. Tell us more about, number one, that description, and then number two, how that sketch was ultimately reached. Right. So for the description, basically what we had to do was we've combined the information that we received from the FBI forensic video analyst who came down back in May um, we had to schedule that with them, and unfortunately, it took them a couple of months to get down here to do that. Um, they came down, and they did a transparent overlay with a, um, I, I guess if you want to call it, it's a transparent overlay with the video in the store there, and actually had apparatus set up inside the store to be able to give us an, an approximate height, but a pretty close height from what they're telling us. Um, and that, that's that 5'11 to, you know, 6, or excuse me, 5'10 to 6 foot height range. Um, and then th that was all they would give us. They, they, were, they were not willing to give us a, you know, shoe size or anything like that because they didn't know the type of shoe. So unfortunately, there's, there's parts of that that we would love to have the information for, but because we only get that one shot to make the best case we have, and when we present this to a jury, we have to be able to give the best case we can. And once we own that, that, you know, description, or once we put out that description, we own it. That's what we're stuck with that description from now on. And there's not a whole lot of leeway because a defense attorney will, will eat you alive when you come back with that. So that was per the first part of the description that we did get out. Um, the second part of the description, which came along at the same time as the, the sketch did, um, of course, was, was, was from Kelly Lawson. She's the GBI um, forensic sketch artist. Um, and after going back over all of the video and the still shots that we could we could get to her, she had absolutely everything that we have as far as video. And she was able to start with, she didn't feel confident with thinking that she could, because of the quality of the video, didn't feel confident with putting out any kind of features of the person's face. So she we we kept asking, hey, what can we do to make this and do that? She finally went back and, and drew a, drew a picture um, drew a sketch and said that she didn't feel real confident with putting it out to the public to start with, but these were her ob observations of the video and what she could sign her name to. Uh, so finally, she drew the sketch, and then once she drew the sketch, she came back and she said, hey, you know what? I think this is probably good enough to put out to the public. So, and she actually, con you know, you know, did consult with her mom, uh, Marla, who was the original sketch artist, and um, so her mom and she got together and decided they felt really confident with this sketch. And, uh, and so that's why they, they gave it to us and we put it out as soon as she did, but we didn't want to release that until she was confident with the final product. So, you know, all these processes, you know, have been in the works since the very beginning of the investigation. Again, here comes the time thing. We're still, we're, it just takes time to get some of these things lined up and done. Um, and and that's, that's the thing. Um, another thing that I want to point out about that sketch as well is that, you know, I need everyone to understand that that sketch is not an exact rendering of the suspect. That sketch is, is a, I would say it's a educated um, 
forensic artist version of what they believe they can see in the video, what they believe that they can put out there. Um, and and it, was, it was not drawn for someone to take that sketch and put it in a side-by-side -side comparison with pictures that people would find on the internet. Like if you go through searching Facebook and different things like that, trying to put those pictures beside each other, you're going to find 20 or 30 pictures that look a lot like that sketch. Sure. And unfortunately, that's not who it's for. Um, the, the sketch is generally created so that it will, you know, generate that mother, that grandmother, the girlfriend or close relative that recognizes a suspect that they'll hopefully call us with those credible tips. And that's also why we don't release any other video footage from the store is because when we have, we have to have a way to validate those tips. Um, of course, we're still getting tips. I mean, we get tips all the time. People, a lot of them now, because of the sketch coming out, are those side-by-side -side comparisons that they're finding on Facebook, they're finding on other social media, you know, streams, and they're saying, oh, this, this, this guy looks like it. Well, then we ask them, well, who is this person to you? And they don't know. It's just somebody they found on Facebook. And that's, that's, that's great. We still want to keep it out there. At least people are looking. But understand that that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for that, that person to call us um, and to validate those tips that come in. For example, if a person calls us and tells us specific things that the suspect told them that they did prior to entering the store, after leaving the store, some of that stuff, the, the video that we have, we can validate that person to say, this is a real good tip or this is not necessarily a credible tip because they're telling us stuff that really didn't happen. And we know that because of the video that we have. So that's, that's why we can't release that video. And I'll be honest with you, there is video of the exterior of the store. There's video, more video of the interior of the store, but that video that's there is all we've got. And, and the more we release, the less we have to validate those tips when they come in to find out whether they're credible or not. Yeah, and I, so you are saying, though, that you have seen an increase in people reaching out as a result of the sketch and the description, correct? Yes, sir. I, well, it, it started back with, the, of course, the, the, um, the, first, the first reward increased to 25000 then we went up to the 50000 There's always an influx of more tips when the, when the, when the uh, amount goes up. And so, you know, that, that's pretty much where we're at right now is, is that the sketch coming out with a little bit more description. We're still getting a lot of tips. And, and you know, again, from the very beginning, um, Investigator Eaton has been assigned to this case and this case alone. He's not working anything else at the sheriff's office. That's the only case he's working. And so he's tracking down all of these tips and, and calling people and trying to find out who they are, who the, who the person is that they're saying is the one that did it. Um, talking to the actual tipsters to to say, hey, you know, this is this is what we've got to do to find this person, or where can we find this person so we can talk to them. You have to do a lot of end around um, hunting, so to speak, to find people sometimes without going straight to that person because you want to learn as much about them as you can before you ever actually talk to them. So that's that's what we're still in the process of doing with all of those cases. I want to say there's 31 files for for you know, people that have been called in that we're trying to narrow down, so. Wow, wow. well, let's talk about that. You mentioned the reward. It's been increased to $50,000 with the hopes that that will bring someone forward, like you just said. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth, you know, people have questions about how rewards work. Uh, can you right. just set the record straight for us right now? $50,000, if someone comes forward that leads to the arrest and conviction of Elijah Woods killer, they receive $50,000, is that correct? Yes, sir. So that, I will say, yes, that's exactly correct. But I want to explain a little bit about the reward. So when you have a reward from law enforcement, you know, we have, we have money that's been uh, put up front by the uh, Racetrack Corporation. We've got money that's been put up by the FBI. We've got money that's been put up by um, the, uh, the Sheriff's Reward Fund. So when people ask about these different reward funds, most of that reward money is not sitting in hand anywhere. So the, the money is, is more of a promissory amount to say, this is the amount that if this reward needs to be paid out, we promise we will give this amount to you in order to make that happen. The sheriff's office does not handle any money. I, I don't handle the money at all. When we set up the reward fund, the reason for that was because we had many, we had a lot of people that were wanting to donate. And I told them I can't hold the money 
So, and there were so many coming in, I didn't have time to write down all their names as promissory for every hundred dollars here, two hundred dollars there. Um, you know, so that's why we created the sheriff's reward fund. It actually was an account that was already open at the bank. I was reminded of that account, and so we just said, okay, let's go ahead and put that out there and let people donate to that. So that's where that's at. That amount, the bank, the the actual uh, sheriff's reward fund has never gotten over about five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So I mean, it's right at five thousand dollars. We've got you know the fifteen thousand from racetrack. We've got the twenty thousand from the FBI, and then we've got the five thousand. So that's where we've gotten up to the uh, you know right up to the. $50,000 mark. And so that was what we wanted to try to get it to. And uh, and if we get more money and, and time goes longer, it might go up again. But unfortunately, if you increase that on a rapid basis, then people are going to wait until the money gets up to a certain level before they bring the information to you. And, you know, that that's something we don't want to happen. And, and right now, that's, that's the donations we've got up to this point are just to the $50,000 mark. So that's where we're at. And yes, if, if someone gives us information that leads to the arrest of this, to this killer, um, we are definitely going to give them a $50,000 check. Thank you for clarifying that. Just wanted to make yes, sure we got that on the record. Uh, last question for you here, and not necessarily a question, but one thing I always try to allow you and, and any law enforcement official that comes on the podcast to be able to do. First of all, uh, your message to your community. Uh, you know, there are many people in the community that's eyes are on the sheriff's department right now. So let's start there. What's your message to uh, the people that elected you as sheriff? Well, I, I'm going to I'm going to kind of couple it all in together, but I'm going to start with Elijah's family. And I want them to know that I go to bed every night and I'll wake up every morning thinking about Elijah and the person that took him from you. Um, the investigators are also dedicated um, just as dedicated as I am to bringing this murder to justice. And I want to thank the community for the outpouring of support. I want to, um, for the family, for Elijah's family and for the sheriff's office, um, as we get through this arduous process. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I want to speak directly to the mother, the grandmother, the cousin, the girlfriend, the close relative, um, anybody that knows this suspect personally and has the information related to this heinous crime, there's a $50,000 check with your name written on it. Okay. I'm begging you to do the right thing and call the Oconee Sheriff's office and give us that information. Um, lastly, I'd love to speak directly to this murderer. You senselessly took the life of Elijah Wood who was loved by all who knew him, his family especially, the friends that he had. Um, you can't change that now. But you can definitely bring closure to this family and to this case by turning yourself in. Either way, you're going to get caught one way or the other because we're not going to stop looking for you until we find you and bring you to justice. And Tariff, one final question for you. Thank you for all of that. What is the phone number where you can be reached at for someone who might have information on the case? The, the best person to call is going to be investigator Zach Eaton, uh, 706-769-3945, or you can get him at Z-E-A-T-O-N at oconeysheriff.org. Um, or if you just dial the 769-3945, ask to speak to Zach Eaton. They're going to put you in contact with him. Um, if he's not available or on another line or out talking to somebody else, they'll either forward it to his cell phone or they'll forward it to one of us here in the office, and, and we'll get on it. So um, any tip that comes in is a credible tip until we determine that it's not of value. Um, but, you know, we're going we're gonna to work every, everything that comes in, and, and we're going to continue to work this case. Well, Sheriff James Hill from Classic City Crime, myself and everyone listening, I want to thank you for taking time to speak with us, for bringing us up to speed on this case. I join you and I send you and your uh, department thoughts and prayers, but we know that thoughts and prayers are not enough in this situation. We need answers and we need the right lead. So I too join you in that encouragement to the community. Sheriff, thank you so much for your time. God bless you and keep you and uh, we'll keep in touch and please let us know if we can do anything to assist you. Thank you, Cameron. I appreciate you for having me on.